BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. I hope everybody had a good weekend, and just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. The first is that, um, a reminder really, that this show is available for free downloads at Launchpad 1. There's a link to that in the description box. If you would like to download the audio pr- version of this program as a pure podcast, take it on the go anywhere and anyhow, you can use Launchpad 1. If you would like to download the video version with images, then you can use YouTube Premium but that one you have to pay for. Launchpad 1 is free. There is a link to that in the description box. And uh, there is also a link to buymeacoffee.com. And if you would like to make a donation to help support the show, anything is greatly appreciated. And I'll read your shout-outs later on on, in the episode, and that will happen every Zodiac Monday. So uh, thank you so much to all of the recent supporters. And a lot of things in the description box to go through. Now, there are a couple reasons why I do this Zodiac Killer News Report. For about maybe three years, I would talk about the Zodiac Killer on Black Box Online Radio, and maybe even more than three. Oh, goodness, what is it? Probably at least four and a half or something that I was regularly talking about the Zodiac Killer here on BBOR. And I did it mostly subject by subject. Like, I'll do an episode about Arthur Lee Allen, or I'll do an episode about Richard Gajkowski and the suspects, and then it turned into some of the other theories, and even some uh, things like the psychological aspects of the case, or I even did the one episode on do they have the Zodiac Killer's DNA. So that was, um, you know, all well and good, but there was a real benefit to doing this as the Zodiac News Report. The first reason is I can talk to you guys about a bunch of different subjects all at once. The second reason is... We always have the opportunity for follow-ups. Say, for example, if there's something last week that can be expanded upon into this week's episode, why not go for it? And I would like to begin with discussing the Zodiac suspect, Xenophon Anthony. Last week on the news report, I was talking about Kelly Marshall's uh, YouTube channel, and she is a supporter of the Xenophon Anthony theory. She believes that Xenophon was the Zodiac killer. And she released two new videos talking about some of her evidence. She is most famous for the documentary Zodiac Rushed Editor, where she uh, had attempted to solve the 340 cipher. And I had always been skeptical of Xenophon Anthony as a Zodiac killer suspect, because last week I was saying that he comes under suspicion because there was a famous story that he was seen at one of the Zodiac crime scenes. The final one, actually, the murder of Paul Stein. He was seen at the crime scene by an eight-year-old child who saw this person and identified him by name. Said, I saw Mr. Xenophon Anthony leaving the taxi cab 
where Paul Stein was murdered on October 11th of 1969. And what I did was I pulled up an article from crimeandtime.com that said Xenophon Anthony was not actually seen at the site of the shooting, like at the taxi cab. He was seen walking a few hundred yards away from the scene. And there are some reasons why I had believed that that had been the more accurate version of the story. Number one is that the um, I thought there would have been an, an enormous amount of suspicion, way more suspicion put on this guy, Xenophon Anthony, if he had actually been seen right by the taxi cab where Paul Stein was murdered. And the second is there was a big amount of press, again, around some of the other witnesses, most notably the Robbins kids who saw the Zodiac leaving the scene of um, the Stein shooting, again, uh, the Zodiac's final crime, and they're the reason why we have those composite sketches of the Zodiac killer, and we didn't really get that from this eight-year-old child. However, Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com wanted to dispute that claim that was shared in Crime and Time, and he says that um, there They've almost certainly identified the eight-year-old child who lived at 3898 Washington Street, and uh, P Paul Stein was murdered at uh, Washington and Cherry. I'm only going to say his first name, Robert, uh, but um, it is online, and he was overlooking the crime scene. He was eight years old and two months on October 11th of 1969. Now, he denies that he was the eight-year-old. People have found this guy, Robert. He denies being the eight-year-old who spotted Xenophon Anthony as a witness, but Richard Grinnell simply wanted to say that the quote from the Crime and Time article is not true. And, um, I mean, Richard Grinnell also did direct me to um, a report that he had shared on ZodiacCiphers.com, which seems to corroborate that, so it seems like that is the more accurate version. But Richard Grinnell wanted to address, why wasn't this eight-year-old given more of, well, of a soapbox to stand on and share his message about witnessing a crime that was committed by the Zodiac Killer, and not exactly one of the Zodiac's crimes, but seeing him at the taxi cab, wiping it down or moving things around in the taxi, because perhaps to the best of our knowledge, the Zodiac murdered Paul Stein inside of the taxi, and no one knew to be on the lookout for a man with a gun who was going to blindside a taxi driver, but being at the crime scene, why didn't this eight-year-old get a bigger chance to share his story, or why weren't more people familiar with this? And what Richard Grinnell said was, he would have been foolhardy of the police to reveal the identity of the eight-year-old to newspapers if he did. The interesting thing for me is that if this eight-year-old identified Xenophon Anthony in relation to the murder, so if he did spot the Zodiac by the taxi cab, one might conclude that Xenophon Anthony looks somewhat like the sketch, even if the child was mistaken. In other words, the Zodiac looks so much like Xenophon Anthony, somebody the child must have known, he mistook the Zodiac for Xenophon. However, in a later FBI file, Xenophon Anthony was ruled out using fingerprints, presumably the bloody ones. As you stated, Anthony's image doesn't look totally dissimilar to the sketch, and he was 38 years old in 1969. The only reason that he may deny being the child, that's Robert, the name of the um, eight-year-old alleged eyewitness, the only reason why he may deny being the child is because he doesn't want to get dragged into the Zodiac scene. Some people like the Robbins kids and Brian Hartnell are wary of all the hassle they are inevitably going to receive. I mean, some people might just view that as, um, it's something tragic in their in their lives that they dealt with, even like witnessing a murder. And we've encountered this in other um, true crime cases, when someone who has a part to play in it, where they have information, simply says, yes, um, that was me, I was present there, it was a dark time in my life, and those were a lot of bad memories, or I want nothing to do with that, I just want to kind of forget that experience. But um, the examples that I was thinking of are actually things that are a little bit more physical, than simply seeing a man wipe down a taxi cab outside of the window. But um, you um, just heard there, Anthony was ruled out using fingerprints, presumably the bloody ones. And what we're talking about was similarities to the Zodiac composite sketches. That I said last week that 
I thought that Xenophon Anthony had perhaps the closest resemblance to the facial structure of the Zodiac composite sketch, most notably the nose and the hairline. I think that a lot of other suspects heavily resemble the composite, but they don't have that exact nose shape. And uh, Richard says something very interesting in this email, and that is that this guy had, you know, some similar facial features. Did this eight-year-old kid look out the window in the dark and simply think that, you know, he's just getting like a couple glimpses of the guy? Did he mistakenly say that that was Xenophon Anthony? Because without that, I don't know if Kelly Marshall or any other supporters of that theory would have um, a lot to stand on. But who was Xenophon Anthony? I um, would like to go to a post that was written by somebody who is simply known as Laura Kate. I've read this a couple times, but I just really appreciate the way that she organized some of these, ma this material. And this is available on Tabatalk. It's a forum post. But again, I just think that she um, provided some clarity about the background info on Xenophon. And she said that... Um, he actually went by the nickname Zine. He spelled it X-E-N, but he pronounced it Zine. And this guy needs some more thorough vetting. He wasn't even on the radar until a few years ago. Well, I mean, which one is it, though? Was he on the radar, or was he eliminated by the FBI? I mean, maybe maybe we can reconcile it by saying that they looked into the guy, he was eliminated, but then there's a resurgence in popularity. Xenophon Anthony's middle name was Lusby, though his full name is Xenophon Lusby Anthony, and some people pronounce it Xenophon. I'm kind of in the habit of saying Xenophon. And in 1969, he lived at 3218 Jackson Street. He was 38 years old. Xenophon Anthony was born on January 28th of 1931 in Spokane, Washington, to Dr. Mark and Ruth Anthony. He graduated from Lakeside School in Seattle in 1949, Graduated from Harvard in 1953, he was married to Valerie Ann, sorry, yeah, married Valerie Ann Moore in Los Angeles in 1956, and he had children, Mark Anthony II, Peter, who was, um, oh, uh, Peter was born in 1959 in San Francisco, and he lived in San Marino until 1966, moved to San Francisco also in 1966, he had a vacation home in Inverness. He enjoyed landscaping. He worked in retail and wholesale. When it says he worked in retail, I actually think he was somewhat of a um, um, prosperous businessman, actually. And he did that until 1976, when Valerie M. Anthony founded Stern School, an alternative school. Xenophon became the business manager for the school and maintained the school building. The school started with only 10 students. He retired in 2000, and they moved permanently to Spokane. He died in 2016. Um, well, I mean, that's a, that would be a very, very big um, change in life. Somebody is going to be the Zodiac Killer, and then they're going to go open up a school with 10 students and do some type of alternative education. But, you know, a lot of serial killers do things like that. And I'm not saying Xenophon Anthony was the Zodiac, but serial killers do things like that. And, um, BTK, for example, Dennis Rader was heavily involved with um, his church, the Scouts, and he's trying to um, be somewhat of a leader. I mean, you encounter this stuff all the time. People are very good at putting on facades. That's what serial killers do. They are caught up in this type of acting gig. But Laura Kate does have some things to say about the eyewitness. There was an eight-year-old witness to the Paul Stein murder, and he lived at 3898 Washington Street. He ID'd Xenophon Anthony by name at the scene. He is the great-great-grandnephew of Leland Stanford, the founder of Stanford. And um, I'll just say his name is Robert. And on the night of the Stein murder, the police questioned a white man who was walking on Jackson but let him go when he said he lived nearby. Mm, well, you know, like, the reason why I have such a problem with this statement and these suspects who are living near the Stein murder is I think it's just in a way of somebody trying to force their theory. They're trying to provide some type of explanation where they're jumping to conclusions that, oh, the Zodiac evaded capture because he walked home. He went straight home after he murdered Paul Stein. And I don't believe that we have the exact the exact um, amount of info and resources to do that. But one more time, this is 
a post that was written by Laura Kate, and you can get this on Tapa Talk. The full name is Xenophon Anthony. How come he was ruled out? I will share one thing with you is that some people say in the comments section that simply they don't think that he should be eliminated on fingerprints alone. How do we know that those were the Zodiac's fingerprints, even if they are imprinted in the blood? Could somebody else have touched the cab? I don't know. I think that is also making assumptions. But what do you think about Xenophon Anthony as a Zodiac killer suspect? And you can weigh in in the comments section. Share anything that you like. If you think that he is a good suspect, please provide your reasons why. And if you think that he is a inferior suspect, please also provide your reasons, and maybe your comments will be featured in a future episode of Black Box Online Radio. To go into a different direction in the next segment here on this channel, I would like to talk about a couple suspects at once, and firstly, they are Richard Gajkowski, who is one of the more famous Zodiac suspects, and Ted Kaczynski, who was the Unabomber. And Richard Gajkowski perhaps became most famous because he was brought forward as a suspect by an informant known as Goldcatcher, whom we now know as Blaine Blaine. But one thing that I did not know was that not only did Blaine say that Gajkowski was the Zodiac and he has a lot of first-hand experience with him, Blaine Blaine was actually a suspect in the Unabomber case, and um, he has been sharing some of... Um, some recollections and telling the story online, and I would just like to read those things for you guys. I did not know this. Was this just common knowledge? I mean, um, if it is, excuse me, but I was completely unaware. In 1995, I was 58 years old. Everyone thought I was lying and that I had to be 49 or 50, including the sheriff and the FBI. So they arrested me as the Unabomber and tore my van apart. They called in the bomb squad, and they slapped me on my face, saying, Shut the F up, Unabomber. In 1995, I was almost 59, and Kaczynski was about 52. Now he is 80, and I am 85. The circumstance around my Unabomber arrest in itself is a chapter in the upcoming book, Goldcatcher and the Zodiac. From this bitter event, the FBI made it very clear the coincidences of what was known about the Unabomber and Zodiac were ultimately transparent, and I had come to the conclusion that the Unabomber and Richard Gajkowski, the true Zodiac killer, were totally different people. Keeping in mind that there was a wealth of facts from Gajkowski, who was an expert on the Unabomber, how he, Gajk, cunningly convinced me for a short time that he, Gajkowski, was the Unabomber himself, and set up my arrest in 1995. By 1996, when Ted Kaczynski was arrested, the hardcore evidence demonstrated that Kaczynski had nothing to do with the Zodiac. And by then, the FBI knew about Gajkowski and how he used his knowledge to blind me, convincing me into thinking that the Unabomber was Gajkowski himself. The author promoting... Actually, I'd like to uh, skip over that part and get back to this one here. And um, it says that... There's just a little bit of trash talk against some other uh, Zodiac researchers. But there is a conclusion that Kaczynski might have been the Zodiac, but his brother and mom, who turned him in, knew there was absolutely nothing to connect him to the Zodiac killer case. And those were the words of Blaine Blaine, the informant known as Goldcatcher, and you've been seeing the um, arrest article, or the article about his arrest there. And um, when he talks about being in the van, Goldcatcher lived in a van for a while, and he has posted some of those photos online. I personally felt that that was like looking at a museum. I was like, that's the van that Goldcatcher used to live in? I've heard stories about this for years. Now I can finally see it with my own eyes. This is unbelievable. But, um, no, I firstly, I absolutely believe that they got the right person in the Unabomber case, Ted Kaczynski, and he has... Um, was sentenced to, what was it, eight life sentences. As far as any type of um, connection to the Zodiac case, you heard Blaine's two sons, and you can weigh in in the comment section down below about what you think about Ted Kaczynski as a Zodiac killer suspect, and it appears that um, Goldcatcher was somewhat of a believer in the Zodiac Unabomber connection for a while before the apprehension of Ted Kaczynski. Did you hear that? He thought that Geik was the Unabomber, now he thinks he's the Zodiac, if you have any responses, I'm curious what you guys think.
And at this time, I would like to remind you guys that I am also a regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel, and I have been working on something with uh, those guys, and it is called a podcast. It is a podcast called Serial Killer Z to A, and the first season is devoted, of course, to the Zodiac Killer and a lot of the unconfirmed crimes. But if you haven't heard all the content over on the Zodiac Killer channel yet, there is something called the Interviews with the Experts series. And I'm also the host of that program. And one of the guests that I had the opportunity of interviewing was Mike Rodelli, who has launched MikeRodelli.com, and he has been very active on social media. And lately, Rodelli has been talking about how he really wants people to still be aware of the fact that the authorities do not have the Zodiac Killer's DNA. Mike Rodelli is the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, as well as The Hunt for Zodiac, that's the print version and the ebook version, and he is a supporter of the theory involving Shel Cavale. And Mike Rodelli's theory with Shel Cavale is quite different because Cavale was in he was a very affluent businessman, perhaps even way more successful than Xenophon Anthony. But I would like to read a post that was written by Mike Rodelli that says, On the Zodiac message boards, people seem to get indignant and mock me when I say that the police may be duping them into believing that the current hunt for DNA is a legitimate one. They think that the police are above doing something like that, but what they don't realize is that they were already duped in 2002. They just don't realize it. Even when a whistleblower comes forward in 2018 that t tells them they were duped. And I reviewed both the ABC show and the statement of the 2018 whistleblower, who was, by the way, a retired SFPD homicide inspector whose identity is still unknown to this day. He or she confirmed that the 2002 DNA came from the outside of what is known to be a potentially highly contaminated envelope and that, more importantly, no DNA was found where it should have been, which is under one of the stamps or the seal of the envelope flaps. In fact, that no DNA could be found under a stamp or a seal led Dr. Holt in desperation to sample the outside of the stamp to get something to give to ABC. The real deception in that show was giving an uninformed public the impression that the DNA was being used to eliminate suspects. I believe that the goal of the show, in retrospect, was directed at the killer, who they assumed was watching that night and whom they wanted to believe that they now had his DNA and that he would soon be identified. I think that they were hoping that he would make a false move on that knowledge. However, the collateral damage of that night was was my credibility when my suspect was quote-unquote ruled out against the DNA, and they did not come, f and it did not come from the killer. Also, another bit of collateral damage was... The public was duped into believing that the, the Zodiac's DNA was in the possession of the police. And if the police were willing to deceive the public in 2002, there's nothing to stop them from deceiving them again in 2022. With this whole notion of re-examining and re-examining stamps and envelopes that the killer did not lick and getting DNA using more and more sensitive and modern techniques and in light of the case... But it's not. It's just a dog and pony show to keep the public stupefied into believing that only DNA can solve the case, when in fact there are other methods that can be used to do so. I'm still hoping that there is someone active in SFPD or VPD who is as disillusioned about the DNA in terms of manipulation in the Zodiac case as I am. If it ain't science, it's politics, and this reeks of politics. And Mike Rodelli informs us that his website is www.microdelli.com, and there's a lot of info there about his um, suspect as well as his books and all of that. Now, I did a more extensive episode on uh, Mike Rodelli's suspect and Shel Cavale, which Mike um, helped co-author. I also did one on the Zodiac's DNA, if you'd like to hear some more um, detailed uh, descriptions of what happened. But Mike Rodelli was talking about it, an episode that was aired on ABC in 2002, and allegedly three suspects were eliminated. One of them is the very famous Arthur Lee Allen. The second is Shel Cavale, as I said, the, um, the affluent businessman, born in Norway in 1919, number one importer of Volkswagens on the uh, West Coast, but I don't want to say anymore because I don't want to misstate something. 
And I asked Mike Rodelli, who was the third suspect that was in question? And he said Charles Clifton Curtis, also ruled out because of DNA. But I think that Mike Rodelli's stance on the subject is very clear. They don't have the Zodiac's DNA. And did you catch that part in that very, um, you know, well-composed post? That somebody was unable to find DNA under the stamp or under the flaps of the envelope. So he, or um, say that the person who was preparing for the ABC show, didn't want to go to ABC empty-handed, so they extracted DNA from around the stamp, touched DNA from around the stamp, which, as Rodelli said, could have been contaminated, it could have been touched by somebody else. How do you actually know that that's from the killer? Uh, this, that, and the other. I think you can get the idea that that could be someone else's DNA other than the killer. And you might be wondering, well, how did um how did the Zodiac mail these letters without leaving any DNA? Rodelli has speculated because his uh, suspect was um, a rather uh, prominent businessman that he did something that was thought to have been high class at the time, and he would seal the envelopes by dipping a sponge into water and pressing the sponge along the envelope and then closing them. He could not have foreseen the um, advancements in forensic science, but he didn't lick them. This wasn't about hiding his DNA. Nobody would have known about DNA in 1969 or been as worried as they are now. They'd be more worried about things like fingerprints. So he sealed the stamps with water, long story short, but I have a more extensive episode on that. And at this time, I would like to give some shout-outs to all the people who supported uh, Black Box Online Radio at buymeacoffee.com. And as I said, if you make a contribution to the show, it will go into future efforts for this channel such as um, things with equipment, or even just buying more true crime books so I have things to talk to you guys about. And the first one comes to us from Andreas G., who says, My favorite YouTube podcast. Keep up the good work, Ned. Excellent material. I usually listen at night before going to bed. Thank you. Hey, Andreas, thank you so much. But um, for a while on this channel, I was... um thinking about expanding into something called the Podcast for Sleep, which I ended up doing on Astrocyte 400. There is still a single episode of the Podcast for Sleep here on BBO War, because some people were saying that they use this program to fall asleep at night, and I do too, actually. Back in um, 2018, I think it was, I started using audio to go to sleep, and I do it every single night if I am able to do so. And um, I use Black Box Online Radio. So I thought, why not create the podcast for sleep? Something that will actually help people fall asleep. And I did one episode that is available here on BBOR, which I would invite you to listen to. And you can always check out Astro Psych 400. Yes, it's great to support the show with something like buymeacoffee.com or Killer on a White Horse or the Teespring page with the t-shirts and coffee mugs. But the absolute best way that you can help this channel is just by listening to some more episodes and go through the older pieces of Black Box Online Radio. And um, I really uh, do appreciate all the people who listen to some of the older far-out episodes, whether it's the Black Box recordings or uh, some of the shorter podcasts, like the 20-minute episodes. You guys are all awesome. The Bible Group has our next um, shout-out. And the Bible Group says, Hi, Ned. Enjoy your day. May our Heavenly Father watch over you always. Bible Group, thank you so much for your support. Stefan Nyberg says, Ned, may you live long and prosper. Awesome. And we do have um, one from Floyd Black 53 with no message, but your support is greatly appreciated. And Tyler Grover says, happy birthday, Ned. Yes, my birthday was last week when that one came out. And all of you guys who uh, listened to that episode um, where I was talking about that stuff, keep it real. You guys are awesome. And I have one more shout out to give. And that is to James Cheney, who made two new images for the show. One of them is the Black Box Online Radio Graphic, and another one says, Monday is Zodiac Monday, Wednesday is the AMA, or the Ask Me Anything, and Friday is on Anything Goes, where any subject is fair game. Now, this year on the channel, I haven't been doing the AMAs like I did last year, but I want to use this graphic anyway because there are dozens of Ask Me Anything episodes where I would respond to your questions and comments and would go through the episode together having a discussion. 
So I would invite you to check out some of those. I mean, you want to listen to some content? The AMAs have lots of Zodiac material. And uh, James, thank you for these here. But as far as the Anything Goes segment on Friday, I've been doing a discussion about Stephen Avery and making a murderer. And believe it or not, there is a Zodiac killer, Stephen Avery connection. And that comes to us from the wonderful John Cameron, the man who promotes Edward Edwards as the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer operated in 1968 and 69, who started out by targeting couples in lovers' lanes who were in cars. And John Cameron's theory, more or less, is that Edward Edwards did some very similar crimes like that. He would target lovers' lanes, couples in cars, But what John Cameron does is he actually accuses Edward Wayne Edwards of committing 660 murders. And even though I am not someone to know absolutely every detail of the inside and outs of his Zodiac Killer Stephen Avery theory, I believe he's referring to the 2005 murder of Teresa Holbach, which sent Stephen Avery back to prison. Stephen Avery was convicted of a crime in the 1980s. the rape and attempted murder of a woman named Penny Bernston, and then DNA revealed that it was not him. It was actually another criminal named Gregory Allen. But then, only two years after he was exonerated and released, he then was sent back to jail for the murder of of Teresa Holbach. And did he actually do it, or was he framed? Why would he be framed? Well, it's because after he got out of prison, he filed a lawsuit for $36 million dollars for wrongful imprisonment. And John Cameron's theory is that the Zodiac killer, Edward Wayne Edwards, orchestrated the whole thing to get Stephen Avery thrown back in jail. Why would he do that? I think you can take a few guesses if you haven't heard John Cameron in an interview. Because one of the journalists who covered the Zodiac killer case was named Paul Avery. And um, I think it was on the Opperman Report in that interview... John Cameron says very clearly, that's how Ed Edwards operated, and that's how he was able to um, get away with this. He would commit murders, and then he would blame other people for it, and he would leave these little signatures that would show how and why the crimes were committed, such as Paul Avery, Stephen Avery, and that is, um, I just have to leave it there, and I mean, you can respond if you want, but I think that that type of thinking speaks for itself. And that, as I said, he accuses Ed Edwards of 660 murders, and at that point, I'm just tempted to say that John Cameron seems like someone who is just playing a game. He is just trying to show off. It's like, does he really believe that all of these things are true? He's also accused the Zodiac Killer of murdering Jean Benet Ramsey. He's accused the Zodiac Killer of murdering Darley Rudier's kids, and... You're probably going to have to do a lot better than that than just saying that Stephen Avery and Paul Avery had the same last name. I mean, maybe if it was Avery Lee with an L-Y or something like that, then you'd have a bigger case to stand on. But no, no, even that, even that, though, like, that's, I mean, that, I was being um, uh, facetious there for a second. But you, you really have to have a little bit more hard evidence than to say that, oh, yeah, this is my suspect because, um, his name is John Smith, and then someone else named Smith passed away. Therefore, um, there must be some type of connection, because Smith and Smith, or how about Jones and Jones, and Johnson and Johnson, or how about Avery and Avery? So, if anyone ever asks you in the future, what is what do you think about Edward Wayne Edwards as a Zodiac Killer suspect? You can uh, respond the way you would. I know what I would say. There's just a whole lot of messing around. And moving on to the next segment here. Last week on the channel, I was talking about the YouTuber John Sun as he's the creator of Bulldog Mindset, which is a different program available here on YouTube. And he entered into some type of personality conflict with another YouTuber named John Anthony. And the disagreement is over how do you confront scammers? And I try and relate this to the Zodiac Killer mystery because. There are lots of people out there who are selling Zodiac Killer books, and I personally believe that some of them are genuine frauds. They are not people who are 
simply promoting an alternative theory that they happen to support. No, they are genuine frauds. They're lying to people. Sometimes it could be done for profit. Sometimes it might just be done for attention, and they just want to draw up a crowd, or they want to be interviewed, or they want the cameras on them. But a lot of the times, I think it's mostly done with trying to earn a little bit of money. And I listed off several people in last week's Zodiacular News Report. And if you haven't heard that one yet, that should have been May 23rd of 2022. And there's a very big section in there on Zodiac frauds. But as I said, I played a video clip from John Sonnez of Bulldog Mindset. And somebody made a response to his video. And by somebody, I mean, it's the guy he's in this feud with, John Anthony. And I'm going to play a clip from his channel, it's called John Anthony Lifestyle, talking about how we should confront scammers. Let's say that we had a whole bunch of people openly robbing people, okay? Should we say, oh, well, the behavior of robbing people is bad, okay? But let's let this robbing continue, uh, because we don't want to say any of their names. Yes, yeah, saying their names fucking singles them out and lets people be aware so they're not robbed too, okay? Call Everyone knows robbing is bad, okay? Everyone knows shithead fucking scamming behavior is bad. That's nothing new. I'm not going to go and make a bunch of videos. Oh, yeah, well, uh, this kind of scamming behavior is bad. This kind of scamming behavior is bad. This kind of scamming behavior is bad. Everyone fucking knows that. That's not up for debate. Everyone knows that it's wrong to fucking rip people off. Everyone knows that it's wrong to pretend to be an expert. Okay, everyone knows it's wrong to be a fake guru. The fucking, you know, major uh, important point is it's this fucker being a huge fucking piece of shit. RSD Tyler. It's this fucker being a fucking piece of shit. Okay? And naming them all in turn with the reasons why. Okay? And that's not slander when I'm giving actual real true things that are behind that. Okay? I'm not inventing facts or giving, you know, speculations based on what I think. I'm showing this motherfucker is a motherfucker for this reason and this reason and this reason. Okay? There's no reason to just talk about the behavior in general. Okay, it's like if I just start making videos, uh, it's wrong to kill people. It's wrong to kill people. You shouldn't kill people, right? And then we have, like, all these people going around killing people. We're not going to talk about those people, okay? Especially when they're part of the fucking, you know, actual community doing this fucking shit. No, we're just going to talk about the behavior. I don't need... And that goes on for a while. But I think you can get the idea. And I don't know if this was a publicity stunt or not, because... These two guys that are in this type of personality feud are friends, and they even say that at the beginning of both of their episodes, but there really doesn't seem to be too much of a disagreement, because in the clip that I played last week, it seems extremely similar to this one from John Anthony when it says that if you're going to call somebody out for being a scammer, then provide reasons to do so. Yes, call people out by name. And last week on the channel, I shared the people that I thought were genuine scammers selling Zodiac Killer books. But at this time, I would like to introduce that as a challenge question to you guys. Who is someone whom you believe is a genuine fraud selling Zodiac-related materials? And if you do respond to the challenge question, I would like to see your reason why in the comments section. It's like a two-part question, who and why. And as I said, I shared my responses last week, but not a lot of people weighed in. So I would invite you to do so. But if you listen to that clip from John Anthony there, in between the expletives, he did say something about there's a difference between actually providing the reasons and simply speculating. Because to do somewhat of an abrupt Zodiac Killer pivot, there's a guy out there named David Gold who is running a YouTube channel, and he's selling a book called My Dance with the Zodiac Killer. And he talks about how the Zodiac Killer was Frank Morris, and um, also with a, with assistance from John and Clarence Anglin, the three guys who did the escape from Alcatraz in 1962. And some people genuine say, genuinely say that he is a fraud. As for me, I have my suspicions, but I cannot prove it. Like, I cannot show you the reasons why I think that he is a fraud, other than the fact that he says that he doesn't remember a lot of the events that he has learned about his suspect, Frank Morris, whom he claims that he knew personally, and that's how he formulated his Zodiac theory. He knew these guys for years. 
I mean, I can't show you how he's making up the story, but he did say he doesn't remember the stuff firsthand. He uses a technique to unlock memories, and I would still have to put that in the speculative category, so I didn't include him in the fraudulent segment. But um, I would like to ask that question one more time. Who is a genuine fraud selling Zodiac materials and why? As for David Gold, though, you guys know I follow his videos because I'm always curious what people have to say. He put out a video recently on the murder of Ray Davis, which occurred in 1962. And even if, even if you just get away from this Zodiac Alcatraz conspiracy, Zodiac Alcatraz far out theory, the reasons why he talked about how this possible crime that was committed by the Zodiac killer should be listed as non-Zodiac were rather interesting because Ray Davis was a taxi driver in Oceanside, California, who was murdered in April of 1962. A lot of people believe that he was the first uh, confirmed victim of the Zodiac. This was the absolute first Zodiac crime. And I'm more on the side that I don't believe Ray Davis was killed by the Zodiac killer. There's a lot of uh, debate and discussions going back and forth. But the reasons put forward in David Gold's video about why the Zodiac did not murder Ray Davis is that a lot of people think Ray Davis was killed by the Zodiac because there were phone calls made taking credit for the crime. And the Zodiac made phone calls after the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th and after the Lake Berryessa stabbing on July, not July, September 27th of 1969. But what David Gold said was that that with the murder of Ray Davis, a phone call also came before the crime was committed, saying, I'm going to pull something real nasty here in Oceanside, and you will never figure it out. And that is um completely contrary to the Zodiac's behavior. He also pointed out an observation that I've made myself, and that's that the murderer of Ray Davis threatened a bus driver and the Zodiac didn't kill any bus drivers. The reason why people think that the murder of Ray Davis was the Zodiac killer is, as I said, the taunting phone calls. But as you heard, Ray Davis was a taxi driver, and Paul Stein was also a taxi driver, the final confirmed Zodiac victim. And there are a lot of similarities between the murder of Ray Davis and the murder of Paul Stein. And that leads into what I call the full circle theory, where they think that the murder of Paul Stein is meant to copy the murder of Ray Davis, like the first and the last. And the second crime could have been the Domingo Edwards murders in 1963, which was meant to copy. And the Lake Berryessa stabbing was meant to copy that. So it's kind of working in a circular pattern where the Zodiac's activity is trying to do just that, go full circle. I think some other reasons why the Zodiac did not murder Ray Davis are that the body of Ray Davis was moved to a dump site, which was placed, oh, near the home of the mayor of Oceanside, actually. The Zodiac absolutely did not do that. Zodiac had so many opportunities to move somebody's body. Say, for example, at Lake Herman Road with David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, at, there were no witnesses. No one saw those murders. We have no idea what the perpetrator looked like at Lake Herman Road. He could have transported somebody's body to a different location and done some type of weird posing and arrangement of the body, but he did not. The Zodiac almost never touched the bodies of the victims post-mortem. And also, I mean, I really think it's kind of a reasonable observation that the Zodiac didn't make a phone call before Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs, to the best of our knowledge. I mean... I suppose anything's possible, but I don't think we have any record of that. So that crime appears to be somewhat different. And then there are people out there like Michael Cole, who is the author of the Zodiac Revisited trilogy, who says that many of the unconfirmed crimes are are the work of the Zodiac. He includes um, the Domingo Edwards murders, the Swindle murders, Sherry Jo Bates, Donna Lass, Kathleen Johns. All of those crimes were committed by the Zodiac but he does not include the murder of Ray Davis from 1962 because he believes that the Zodiac was driven by heterosexual animosity. More or less what um, law enforcement even talked about at the time, 
saying that there was a sweetheart slayer on the loose in Southern California going after the um, Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards on June, June uh, 4th of 1963, then going after Johnny Ray and Joyce Swindle in 1964, heterosexual animosity, targeting couples, a man and a woman together, and then changed the pattern with the murder of Sherry Joe Bates because he wanted to do something very methodical, and it's definitely a cold, methodical, and calculating theory if you ever read the Zodiac Revisited trilogy by Michael Cole, but that also excludes the murder of Ray Davis, and you can always um, share your observations about the murder of Ray Davis from 1962. I know you guys in the comments section have really looked into a lot of um, his, a lot of the reasons why you believe that he was a genuine Zodiac victim and that it's part of a bigger theory. I'm always going to be listening and mostly, mostly approaching things with an open mind. But on the notion of Zodiac scammers, there are also some people where I don't think that they're necessarily frauds. I just think that they are confused and they might not even understand what's going on them themselves, and they're the type of people who don't necessarily care about the truth. Instead, they're just trying to talk in circles and see if anybody is listening to them at the end of the day. And I did this one episode once called um, How True Crime Writers Lie to Us, and I really didn't get to include a lot of those observations. But that's it, though. That's it. They're just trying to treat it like a storytelling contest, or they're just having fun with it, and they aren't actually paying attention to the the question, did these events actually happen? You know, it's not like a fictional story where like, hey, I'm a big fan of this TV show, and they haven't written the ending yet. I'm really going to try to get the attention of the producers, because I think that my idea for the ending is better than anything they could come up with, and Maybe once we get to season 12, episode 23, they're going to do my episode. No, this, these, are sub, these are real historical events that happen. Real people were murdered, but some people are... When you, you really have to wonder, though, when they're pushing some type of far-out, twisted theory that is involving people who almost certainly couldn't have been the Zodiac, and... Do they even really believe the theory themselves? And I ask that question all the time, whether it's about Zodiac researchers or politicians or people who are involved in like um far out sex of philosophy and psychology that just seem too bizarre for their own good. I'm, I always ask that question. Do they actually believe that? Because I do think that there's a lot of misrepresentation in the world. And um, if you would like, once again, to hear about the uh, scams that I talked about, you can go to the Zodiac News Report on May 23rd, but also you can weigh in in the comments section down below about someone who do you think is a genuine scammer. And if you call them out by name, please provide the reasons why. And, of course, the um, respond to the murder of Ray Davis comments there. But I would like to circle back in a different way to another um, Zodiac suspect, because at the beginning of the episode, I was talking about Richard Gajkowski, and he is the one that was heavily promoted by ZodiacKiller.com when I first began looking into the Zodiac case in 2011. And um, I saw a video about Richard Gajkowski, and I went right over to ZodiacKiller.com. I saw that his name was in red at the top, and he was in red for many, many years. This guy was either a criminal, or he had the worst luck in the world. Because in addition to being accused of the Zodiac crimes, he was also accused of being the Unabomber, as I said at the beginning. Although that seems like its own type of personality feud between Blaine Blaine and Richard Gajkowski. I really don't know what those guys actually did together. Part of me wishes that I had a time machine and one of those, like, animality, animorph capability, so I could have just been a fly on the wall during the um, conversations or interactions between Geik and Goldcatcher. So, what actually happened in, like, is there just um, some very bizarre events that 
uh, went on between these two guys, but we will hear about that in the future. Knock on wood and rich with possibility. If Blaine ever completes his book, Gold Catcher in the Zodiac. But let's look at some of the other possible co coincidences or bizarre things surrounding Richard Gajkowski as a Zodiac suspect. Firstly, the Zodiac wrote letters into newspapers, right? And Richard Gajkowski worked for the newspaper The Good Times, very familiar with the newspaper business. And this is important because it's about having the expectation that this type of story is going to get coverage in this way, this is going to be printed in that way, and the Vallejo Times Herald is the newspaper that got the FBI involved because they contacted the FBI in the Zodiac case because of extortion, and they're like, hey, this person says if you don't print this in the paper, he's going to go on a kill rampage. I mean, that's like something that the FBI would handle, and that type of understanding of the newspaper business that he's going to get a response in a desired way could have um, been somebody like Kaikowski. But the other point is that I revealed that um, solution to the the C-13 cipher, which reveals Kaikowski's age and birth date. And, I mean, again, is that just a coincidence? Is that just manipulating the numbers? If that is, though, that's a pretty big coincidence. And also, there is the Albany connection that I'm sure you've heard about online, where one of the Zodiac killer victims was Darlene Farron, and she goes to Albany, New York, and Richard Gajkowski goes to Albany, New York, and he's working in the same building as Darlene Farron's husband, and then they both go back to California. And what I said back in 2019 on this channel was, if that is true, that he just happens to be working in the same building and her husband on the other side of the country, and then he goes back to California, and she goes back to California, and she becomes the most famous victim in the Zodiac Killer case, and he becomes one of the prime suspects in the Zodiac Killer case, and none of that is actually related. That is just one of the most shocking coincidences in the entire mystery, and the um, Albany connection shouldn't be um, downplayed because... I mean, that I definitely get suspicious about it. I don't know if I could ever bring that into a court of law. And when I had the opportunity to discuss Richard Gajkowski with Tom Foyt on this channel, you can um, hear that in the episode Zodiac Richard Gajkowski AMA. But one point was he told a story via email that the detective Ken Narlo says that he can place Gajkowski in Darlene Farron's home prior to her murder. And... This relates to a bigger theory, and that is that Tom Voigt can correct me if I get any of this wrong, but he thinks that the murders that happened before the Zodiac crimes were also Gajkowski, Ray Davis, Domingo Edwards, Sherry Joe Bates, and then the Lake Herman Road murders beginning in 1968. None of those crimes have an exact letter, then they definitely don't have somebody writing a letter saying, this is the Zodiac speaking, the name Zodiac is not used in any of those crimes. What could have happened? Well, there could have been some type of sexual humiliation going on between Darlene Farron and Richard Gajkowski. Could that have been a motivation for somebody to create the Zodiac persona and target a specific person and the reason why he would tar target Darlene Farron is Richard Gajkowski was a homosexual, but he was still battling his homosexuality, and he wasn't completely sure if he was going to live the life of a gay man, or he's still um, trying to deny that part of his um, existence, for lack of a better term. And there could have been some type of sexual humiliation going on with Darlene Farron, because Darlene was rather open about her sexual choices. And if Richard Gajkowski is indeed in her home, some type of event happened and he couldn't perform and something she did bothered him. So that's why this person who already had homicidal tendencies decided to create the Zodiac persona. It's a way of restoring the broken ego. Now, did that actually happen? Literally? I'm I'm not sure it's an unsolved case, but what do you think you can weigh in in the comments section down below? And at first I thought that 
that would, I mean, this was my own genuine piece of criticism to that theory. That would make a little bit more sense to me if Darlene Farron had been the first victim, if she had been the first victim of this serial killer, not like the fifth or the sixth, as I said, going from 1962 onward, Darlene Farron wasn't murdered until 1969, but then I began to think, well, I do have to admit, she would have been the first victim where the Zodiac would have announced his persona, the first murder committed when the Zodiac was intending to announce his persona, because that, I believe the first time this is the Zodiac speaking is used, is in, um, that was on August 4th of 1969. But I think the reasons why Gajkowski should get a lower rating on the suspect list is all of those are just possibilities, or those are just coincidences. As of now, as of now, and I know Microdelli is saying that we don't have the Zodiac's DNA, but that's not really hard evidence. Or there is a certain element of storytelling and guesswork that has to be incorporated into a theory that is involving Richard Gajkowski. And in the past, I gave him a 5 out of 10 in terms of likelihood of him being the Zodiac, which is only about a 50-50 chance. But then I upped it to 6 out of 10 because of all of the coincidences that just seem to be, I mean, really quite shocking. So I said 6 out of 10, that's not like an 8 or a 9 or something, and I'm definitely not convinced that Gajkowski was the Zodiac, but I cannot understate how much um crap this guy had to put up with in life, because it's not only being accused of the Zodiac or being accused of the Unabomber or trying to... um have some type of crisis of sexuality. Gajkowski was also a schizophrenic. Gajkowski also had cancer and died of cancer in 2004. I mean, it's just prob one problem after another. You know, that whole thing about life as a test, life as an examination, and um, how are you going to respond? Well, I am so thankful that I don't have to um, be accused of being a serial killer dealing with schizophrenia and cancer, all of them, in a 40-year time frame. Well, I mean, who knows what the next 40 years are going to have, but I hope none of that comes about. So, I mean, rest in peace to uh, Dick Gajkowski, and I think that's all. And I would like to thank you so much for listening to this episode. And one more time, though, there are some things that you can find in the description box. Free downloads available at Launchpad 1. You can... Also, support the show at buymeacoffee.com. There's the book Killer on a White Horse, the Teespring page for merchandise. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box as well as a page for Black Box Online Radio. But I mostly interact with my personal page, which you can find there. And there is always blackboxned88 on Instagram. And you can uh, keep in touch, uh, send me a DM if there's something about any of these true crime cases that you would like to talk about. And this year on the channel, I've been doing a regular segment about the Long Island serial killer. And really, um, I didn't expect that it would turn into so many episodes, turning into something like with Zodiac Mondays, well, there's Long Island Wednesdays. Uh, that sounds like um, something that is much light, lighter than it actually is, because... The Long Island serial killer mystery is just absolutely saddening. I mean, yes, the Zodiac killer cases too, because real people were murdered, but all of the um, mutilations and just the stories of dissecting bodies, it's way, way more gruesome in the Lisk mystery. But I've been doing a regular segment about it on Wednesdays, and it really is um, a bigger story to tell because... They have so many more confirmed victims, and even unconfirmed victims. 10 to 16 people were murdered by the Long Island serial killer over a span of about 15 years. It's just short of 15 years, which is a typical reign of terror for a serial killer. That is such a big difference with the Zodiac case, because the absolute concentration of Zodiac activity is from 1968 to 69, whereas the Long Island serial killer was really operating... Um, what what you would think a serial killer would do, there's like a murder in 96, and then in 97, and 2000, 2003. 
buzz. If you'd like to hear more about that case, that'll be coming out on Wednesdays. And for the next couple of weeks on the Anything Goes Friday segment, I'll be doing a story about Stephen Avery, as I said, making a murderer different aspects of the true crime world. As always, you can like and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and I will see you over on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.